I believe it's time to start the panel discussion. Our topic today is closed versus open ecosystems from an antitrust perspective. We have three distinguished panelists uh, to explore this issue, this topic. Maureen Olhausen from Baker Botts, Darren Tucker from Vincent and Elkins, and Hal Varian from Google. Those of you who are uh, uh, participating in hopes of seeing Nikhil Shanbahag from Facebook will be disappointed because he had to he had to cancel at the last minute. This is an area in which there are a lot of buzzwords and terms are thrown around as if their definitions are well understood. But to paraphrase Barney Frank, while we're all entitled to our own opinions, we shouldn't all be entitled to our own definitions. So I wanna ask the panelists when they make their opening remarks to say a word or two about what makes an ecosystem open or closed. Is the key the role of open standards? Something else, a number of things. Let's lead off uh, with Maureen. Well, thanks, Dick. Uh, thanks for, uh, for having me. I'm delighted to be here uh, to speak. Um, so, so on the question of what's an open system or a closed system, uh, I mean, I think those are more terms of a, you know general description than of falling into any particular bucket. But, but one of the things that I, the way I often think about it is when you go back to the old, um, you know, the IBM, uh, <laughs> you know, operating system, which, you know, we had an openness and then Apple had a very different approach or you might see a difference between, um, you know, a standard setting organization where as long as you design to the standard, uh, you know, you can, um, you know, plug in and you can be part of the ecosystem. Uh, versus one where you know it's controlled through a, a single you know a single um, you know manufacturer or a single uh, single entity, um, but but more important not more importantly but as part of that discussion I think one of the issues that's really coming to the fore these days is um, whether open systems uh, or closed systems or you know one is pro competitive or one is you know, anti-competitive, and should antitrust be favoring one one over the other? And um, it, from from my viewpoint, uh, both have pluses, both have minuses, and uh, antitrust shouldn't be picking uh, to say, well, we only want one kind of system. Okay, you have more time. Should you wish to take it? Oh, okay. So I wasn't sure if you just wanted me to answer that one question to start no, off. No, 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 no. I thought you might uh, uh, preface your, your uh, general remarks with a okay. discussion of that issue. Sorry. All right. Great. Well, so talking about like a recent, uh, rep uh, the House Judiciary Committee staff report, um, it kind of critiques, I think, both open and closed sim um, systems. Um, if they created some complaints by some other businesses because they didn't like how that particular system included them or in, in what terms they included them or if they excluded them. Um, and I, you know, I, I have some um, concerns certainly about basing an antitrust analysis simply on the idea that, um, you know, there's some business out there who's unhappy about the way he, he or she uh, or it was, was treated. Um, and as, as I said, antitrust shouldn't favor either open or closed systems. We should kind of let the market evolve, let these choices, you know, because sometimes we've seen consumers want one or consumers want the other, or there's a lot of innovation in one area or, and, uh, you know, or sometimes it swings to, to, the, to the other area. Uh, what any trust law should really be focused on is whether there is some you know, exclusionary conduct going on, right? Something that is not competition on the merits that keeps out another player from, from the market, not by um, having a better system or you know, better options for consumers, but somehow you know, closing down, um, not through being the better competitor, um, access to the market. Um, so while it, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was an open or closed system case, one of the ones that I like to think about in this 
area is a case that we brought when I was at the FTC, uh, the McWain case, which had to do with um, a, a dominant player who locked up the um, distribution channels for a particular product. Um, and that it had a, um, uh, a requirement for the distributors. Uh, it happened to be for, for um, certain types of plumbing supplies, but uh, they had a very high market share in there. And that what they said was through their contracts to these distributors is if you carry a competitor's product, you can't carry ours and or any of ours. Um, and so that um, they weren't adding, you know, anything like because we're giving you supports or we're helping you, you know, we're sharing in the marketing or, you know, something like that it was just a, you know, if you, if you carry them, you can't carry us. Um, and so the FTC brought a case um, and ultimately the commission just, it had a lot of counts, but just upheld on that count. Um, and then the 11th circuit actually upheld the FTC's approach there. So, so just to kind of say that, you know, focusing on exclusionary conduct is, I think, the right approach rather than saying we favor open systems over, over closed systems. One of the other things that I want to mention is that um, the House Judiciary Report talks about, um, well, we, you know, we want to allow um, more entrance into the market. So we're going to require, you know, um, um, access to facilities. Essentially, you know, they don't quite say it this way, uh, but it's, uh, you know, essentially the essential facilities argument. Uh, the idea that, well, you know, these um, uh, facilities, these platforms, these capabilities have become so important that uh, antitrust should for, or regulation, but I think antitrust is what they're talking about, uh, force access to these um, systems. Uh, and then, of course, you have to then do, um, you know, equal terms and at what cost, because all the things that, you know, uh, would we be required. And I have big concerns about the, essential, the idea of an essential facilities doctrine. I mean, as we know, it's never really been accepted in U.S. antitrust law, uh, at least on the Supreme Court level. It's been danced around quite a bit, but it seems to have regain some currency as an idea that that is how we create more competition. We let more competitors into the market by forcing others to share, to share their facilities. And I have large concerns on that. I've dealt with that mainly in the IP space, um, but I think some of these, um, uh, you know, learning in the IP space is um, applicable to the idea of sharing facilities more broadly and in, in two ways. So I, when I was an FTC commissioner, went to China quite a bit and dealt with the, the Chinese agencies there. And they would often say, you tell us we, we should have competition. And, but for competition, you need competitors. And our competitor, our companies want to enter the market and the American companies have the IP that we need to, en to enter the market. So shouldn't they have to share that IP to create, you know, this, the more competitors, because that's what leads to competition. And what that really misses, that whole idea really misses, is the impact on um, investment and the impact on dynamic competition. So yes, you might say today, forcing people to share creates, you know, two more competitors where there was only, you know, previously one, one or two. But the impact on the um, incentives for uh, an entity to invest, to create that better product or, you know, the IP in, in the cases that I was talking about, really gets reduced when they have, they have to share all the risk, right? Their next invention doesn't work out so well. No one's going to be knocking on the door saying that's essential. You know, we're going to share in the costs of <laughs> that investment that didn't work out. They only want to share in the winners, right? So that reduces the incentive to, to invest. And I think that hurts innovation and dynamic competition down the road. Um, so I actually did a, a, a study that looked at the relationship between um, the strength of IP protection and the 
uh, investment in R&D over time over different areas, uh, different um, countries, and found that there really was a strong, you can't say causation, but a strong correlation between stronger IP laws and more investment in R&D, which you know, can be a rough approximation for innovation. Um, so that is one of the main reasons why I'm very concerned about putting forward the idea that we're going to make companies share their facilities just because the competitor wants them to get through the door because I think it will have that kind of suppressing um, effect on investment uh, and ultimately the you know, innovation that leads to more competition down the road. Um, so I, I, I will conclude there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Maureen. Darren, you want to unmute yourself? There you go. Uh, uh, thanks, Dick, and uh, thanks to uh, CPI and CCIA for um, organizing this, I think, very interesting program, and uh, to Dick for organizing the panel. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how competition policy should look at open versus closed software models uh, and talk about one case in particular where an enforcer was critical of the open source business model in a way that I think raises some concerns for the future of open source software development. But let me just start with a little background uh, so we have a sort of common uh, understanding of terminology. So software platforms you know, all rely on different types of business models. On the one end, some software platforms are released under an open source license. And there's a variety of these, but you know, in general, they allow software to be used, modified, and shared with minimal conditions, and usually for free. When most people think about open source software, they think about you know, lots of programmers volunteering their time to collaboratively develop the software in a very decentralized approach. Uh, in other words, a volunteer model. And that's certainly the case with some open source software, um, although we typically do see a nonprofit foundation provide some degree of coordination, such as the Apache Software Foundation. So Linux is an example of you know, very successful open source software. Uh, by many measures, it's the, actually the most successful operating system in the world today. Um, it powers the majority of smartphones, servers, and supercomputers, and is also used in a range of other types of devices like automobiles, game consoles, and smartwatches. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is proprietary software. And I think most people are probably quite familiar with this. Uh, Microsoft's Windows, Apple's iOS are you know, prominent examples of that type of software. And, and typically, well, not typically, but it, for proprietary software, the publisher retains the IP rights to the code. And typically, licensees are not permitted to modify the code. They've defined redistribution rights and usually don't have access to the source code. There's usually payment of a license fee required, although that's you know, certainly not required. And then there's also you know, different hybrid models in between the two. Uh, so one example would be where a for-profit company develops the software, thereby providing an organized governance structure and compensation for the developers, but releases the code under an open source license. Uh, but since the operating system doesn't generate any income to the developer, the developer has to find a way to monetize its investment, typically by selling complementary software services or hardware. So Red Hat is an example of this. They, Red Hat claims to be the world's leading provider of enterprise open source software, and they make money by charging for support and other services running on top of its open source software. Uh, Dick asked a question at the outset of, you know, what is open versus closed? So I've been focusing at this point on, you know, the, the type of license under which a platform is offered. But I think there's other ways to think about, you know, the degree to which a platform is open or closed. You know, some other ways you can think about it would be, you know, does the platform provide, you know, ac open access to the APIs? Uh, does the platform sponsor, to what degree does the platform sponsor have degree of control over what apps are available on the platform? To what degree does the platform sponsor control what hardware uh, the, the ecosystem is available on? And what degree of control is there in terms of who the distributors are? You know, is it going to be vertically integrated? Is it going to be licensed out? If it's licensed out, who gets to you know, you know, offer the product uh, to end users? So I think whenever we're talking about open versus closed, it's important to explain what dimension we're talking about. Uh, certainly, you can compare platforms in terms of whether they're more open or less open than the other, but we have to be a little clear in terms of what, which of these dimensions we're talking about. So just to give you one example, when Apple launched the iPhone, Apple did not permit third-party developers to distribute apps on the platform. So 
relatively speaking, that was a fairly closed approach. But Apple then changed course and later allowed developers to access its APIs and to distribute software through the App Store. So it switched to a more open approach uh, early in the iPhone days. So there's benefits and downsides to each of these approaches, uh, open source, closed source, something in between. Uh, and it's important to recognize, of course, that software platforms and multi-sided markets, you know, their success depends on attracting participants to each side of the platform, facilitating interactions. So for on smartphones, for example, this means attracting app developers and users, among other groups. And fully proprietary platforms have a much greater degree of control to facilitate these interactions. So they can specify standards for software developed for the platform. They can even exclude participants that are causing problems, whether it's you know, end users, uh, you know, developers, or other participants in the platform. But open source software platforms have far less control and far less ability to minimize these negative externalities. But on the other hand, they may be able to attract more adopters because of the attractiveness of a more open model and because of the ability to facilitate innovation by incorporating ideas from a wider community of developers. But a downside of open source models is the well-known potential for fragmentation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and I think something that people often forget about is, you know, companies don't just decide to just pick one model. Most, many, or maybe most software developers rely on a mix of open source and proprietary software. Microsoft, Google, and Apple all offer a pretty wide range of both proprietary and open source software. So what are the implications of all this for antitrust policy? So I, my comments here are gonna be, I think, consistent uh, broadly with, with Maureen's comments on this. Um, so I, you know, I think it's important for antitrust enforcers to keep in mind that you know, all these different models, open, closed, hybrid, everything in between, they're all trying to achieve the same thing. They're trying to make the platform attractive to each group of users. They're trying to minimize negative externalities between these groups, and they're trying to grow the platform. And we've seen each model be successful. Windows and iOS are successful examples of proprietary, Linux for open source, and Red Hat for a more hybrid type of approach. So in some markets, we may see the one model is superior appears to be superior based on market performance versus others. Other markets, we may see a different model be more successful. Yet in other markets, we may see successful models actually change over time as the different participants' needs change. So I think for these reasons, again, consistent with what Maureen mentioned, I think it's really important for antitrust policy not to favor one model over another. Instead, we should allow for and actually encourage competition between platforms specifically on this basis. Now, you know, that doesn't mean any particular business model that's a free pass in terms of any trust enforcement, but enforcers and policymakers should be careful they're not adopting policies that would put a thumb on the scale in favor or against any particular model. So that, let me turn next to the, the case I mentioned at the outset. So the European Commission's Android case is an example of an enforcement action that you know, appears to depart from you know, my suggested approach. Um, of trying to you know, keep a balanced approach to looking at each of these different types of models. And there's two aspects of the decision on which I wanna focus. Uh, but first, just a little bit of background for folks that aren't familiar with that case. Uh, so Google released Android under an open source software license, which meant that anybody can access, modify, and redistribute Android without Google's permission and without payment. Uh, Google you know, apparently viewed this as offering a competitive advantage when it was released over the you know, leading mobile platforms at the time, most of which took a more closed proprietary approach. But a risk of Google's strategy was fragmentation. Different adopters could modify the operating system to such a degree that an app written for the version of Android released by Google might not run on devices offered by some Android OEMs or carriers that modified the code, which again was permitted because it was an open source license. And this wasn't a hypothetical concern. Several other open source operating platforms, open source, open source platforms around the time, like Unix and Symbian died in part because of fragmentation. And you can think of fragmentation as essentially the opposite of compatibility or standardization. Software developers would greatly prefer to develop for non-fragmented platforms because of lower costs and ability to reach more users. Users prefer to buy devices running non-fragmented platforms because they'll have access to more apps and there's less risk of an app breaking. So Google's solution to this problem was to offer Android under an open source license, 
but to introduce a compatibility program. So companies that wanted to license a separate set of Google's proprietary software would agree not to fragment the platform by following a set of publicly available technical standards. So any OEM that followed these standards could be assured that apps written with the Android SDK, it's the software development of it, would run on their Android devices. And an important part of the compatibility program that I think is sometimes lost is that partners could still add capabilities to Android. They just couldn't omit features that developers expected. In other words, the key benefits of open source software remain. So the ability to harness a wide pool of developers to facilitate innovation, the potential for wide adoption, and the ability of, develop, of adopters to see exactly what they were getting in the code. There wasn't gonna be any surprises. And notably, many other open source software developers have adopted similar means to control fragmentation. This was not a unique strategy on Google's part. Nevertheless, the European Commission found that Google's Android compatibility program violated EU competition law. Uh, the commission found that the anti-fragmentation obligations were capable of restricting competition for smart mobile operating systems. In other words, the European Commission actually thought of fragmentation of the Android platform would promote competition. Now, this strikes me as a, a clear thumb on the scale in favor of more closed proprietary platforms. That's because all successful platforms must find a way to control fragmentation. It's relatively easy for, for proprietary platforms to do this. They can do it by denying access to the source code, they can prohibit modifications to the code and then other means as well. But open source platforms you know, generally can't do this. And as a result, fragmentation is a much more difficult problem for open source platforms to control. And the unintended consequence of the EC's decision, I fear, is that the next time a developer has an idea for a new operating system or platform, he or she is gonna be less likely to adopt an open source model. Without the ability to control fragmentation, there's a serious risk of an open source platform splintering into a thousand pieces, driving away the developers that are critical to any software platform. So that was the, the first problem with the decision. Another part of this decision actually compounds that problem. So recall that Google licenses Android for free. It therefore needs a way to generate revenue to support its investment in the platform. And again, this problem is not unique to Google. As I mentioned, Red Hat's solution is to sell support and services for its open source operating systems. So Google's solution uh, was similar, but a little bit different from Red Hat's. And so Google's approach was to offer OEMs a suite of free optional proprietary apps that would run on top of the Android operating system. So these included you know, well-known apps like Search and Chrome. And users' exposure to these revenue-generating apps is actually what funds Google's development of the Android platform, which, of course, you know, is more than just actually writing the code, but also providing support to OEMs and developers. Still, the EC condemned the conclusion of Search and Chrome and Google's suite of proprietary apps as a form of tying. And importantly, the EC rejected Google's defense that including these apps benefited OEMs and users by providing a high-quality experience out of the box continued investment in the platform, and continued OEM access to a free platform. And the result of the decision was predictable. According to media reports, Google now charges OEMs for the suite of mobile services that it used to provide for free. In other words, Google was forced to change its business model in a way that made the platform less attractive to its partners and less differentiated from other mobile platforms. Fundamentally, I think the EC's error here was to fail to recognize that the use of open source software you know, is part of a company's broader business model. In other words, it's a way to generate income. Finding ways to generate income from open source software should not be viewed negatively, but rather is key to ensuring continued investment in the development of open source platforms. Corporate sponsors of open source software you know, invest their money in open source software to, to, because they expect the project will stimulate demand for other products or services sold by the firm. And of course, I, I should have mentioned, you know, when Google launched Android uh, and the compatibility program almost, I guess, 15 years ago now, you know, Android had no market power at the time, uh, which strongly suggests there was no anti-competitive intent in selecting this particular business model. So in sum, I, I think, you know, the DEC's decision by condemning Google's efforts to minimize fragmentation and to generate the income needed to invest in an open source platform it creates a, a clear disincentive for software developers to choose open source over proprietary models going forward, which I think in the long run is likely to reduce software innovation and competition to our detriment.
Thanks, Darren. Hal, um, your turn. Feel free to disagree with this defense of, of uh, global <laughs> strategy if, if you'd like, or to make more general points. All right. First of all, I'm going to <clears throat> start with your question uh, about uh, open and closed. Well, I have to say it's not an open and shut question. Uh, in fact, there's a whole range of uh, alternatives. Uh, for example, you could have um, a completely open software system where there were no uh, obligations of any sort. You could have something where not only that, you provide documentation and support. You could have a uh, formal standard setting operation that described the input, output, APIs, et cetera, or it could be something that's informal or negotiated among a uh, consortium. And then there's uh, compatibility we just heard about. And, and uh, I want to emphasize compatibility is used throughout computer science. It's a very standard thing, not just for commercial products, but for non-commercial products. Like, for example, Tech or LaTeX, which is a typesetting language. There's a full compatibility suite. You can only call a product LaTeX if it actually works uh, on that uh, software input and produces the right output. Um, Open APIs, again, we might look at the Supreme Court uh, issue now that's uh, involving Apple, sorry, that's involving um, uh, Google and uh, the uh, operating, sorry, start over again. Uh, we might look at some of the issues involving APIs and uh, whether they are in fact protected automatically by copyright or not, the Oracle and Google cases before the Supreme Court at the moment. Uh, and finally, there's a proprietary system where there's no promises of openness and there may or may not be documentation and there may or may not be compatibility issues and so on. So uh, I think there's a whole range of choices to, uh, to examine. Now, I should say that 20 years ago, Carl Shapiro and I published a book called Information Rules and we discussed exactly this question 20 years ago. There's a chapter on cooperation and compatibility. How do you build an ecosystem? How do you make sure all the parts are working smoothly together? And then also what happens when things break down and you have a standards war where you've got one or more parties competing with a proprietary standard. Uh, and I think it's really useful to go back and look at that because the same problems that Darren referred to have been around for some time. And one of the most important lessons from looking at the, at the history of uh, standard setting, both formal and informal, is that open standards are endangered if they lack a sponsor. You need to have somebody who's trying to herd those cats and get to a situation where you can have a truly open uh, ecosystem. So let me give you an example from history. That was the Symbian Consortium. Yeah. That was a group of mobile phone makers uh, that created an operating system for ARM processors. It was the most popular mobile operating system in the world up until the end of 2010. Now, that was originally started out as proprietary at Symbian, but Nokia bought the consortium in 2008, set it up as a nonprofit Symbian foundation with an open source model in order to create an industry standard that all smartphone uh, manufacturers could use, but it fragmented quite rapidly over a course of a year or so and pretty much disintegrated by 2010. Um, so the industry realized everybody would be better off with a unified operating system, but nobody wanted to move unilaterally. And a player like Nokia, who was a very important player in that industry, was not necessarily trusted to be a neutral manager of this, uh, of this uh, standard. And in fact, uh, Nokia, in fact, it, it was abandoned. They abandoned Symbian in February of 2011, said they used Windows Phone OS going forward. And of course, that gave a big boost on the, on the Windows side. So the in industry had no unifying OS at all. And meanwhile, Apple was gaining strength because they had a very good system. They had a fully operational system. They allowed for apps, as we heard from uh, Darren, and uh, it was really a problem. Now, Symbian was hopelessly fragmented. There was, there, people tried to revive it, but it really uh, never worked. Uh, Microsoft Mobile OS, well, that was a closed system, but it had an existing ecosystem from the desktop world, uh, and it had a strong sponsor, Microsoft. 
But what were the OEMs worried about? Were they worried about what Microsoft would do because they'd seen how they were able to commoditize the hardware and the desktop, essentially, and get all the value through the operating system and software, and they didn't want that to happen uh, in the mobile world as well. Well, along comes Google. It had its first Android phone back in 2008, uh, just a year uh, after the iPhone was released. It was still relatively new, relatively unproven. Uh, was Google really going to support this uh, piece of open source software? Uh, sorry, the, the, this, this uh, non-proprietary software. And so in part to assuage those worries, Google made the software fully uh, open source. It was not only free to everybody, but it was in fact open source and you could do what you want, wanted with it, uh, subject to the kinds of restrictions that Darren already uh, alluded to. So I would encourage you to go to Wikipedia, read the article on Symbian, see what it was at stake, see how it was resolved, because it's a very good lesson for understanding the juncture, the point we're at, uh, at now. And in a way, I will say Apple did the world a favor by having a highly proprietary system, not just proprietary on the, on the device side, but also even the carriers that could offer uh, the iPhone at that time. They kind of drew a line in the sand and everybody on one line would say, we've got to deal with this problem in some way. And uh, Android was the, uh, was the solution uh, in that uh, case. And unfortunately, as Darren described, uh, that solution has been uh, weakened to some degree by these uh, recent uh, developments. Now, Android isn't the only open system that Google offers. Uh, and by the way, just uh, before we leave the Android topic, I should mention that, An that Android has been uh, forked uh, by various other parties. So just as an example, Huawei recently came up with its operating system based on the open source Android. Amazon Fire, that's, uh, in fact, that's a really quite compatible uh, operating system. They've just never applied for the, for the uh, anti-fragmentation uh, agreements. Samsung, Tizen, that's another example. Raspberry Pi, that's another example. Lots of Internet of Things devices. They're all running uh, Android forked versions, not necessarily fully interoperable the way it was described, but nevertheless, it was a huge advantage not to have to write your own operating system for your device. And there's Chromium. So Chromium is the open source version of Chrome, essentially. That's the basis for Opera, Microsoft Edge, Brave, Amazon Silk. They've all taken the Chromium open source and created uh, their own uh, version of it, which had different variations uh, of one sort or another. There's Kubernetes, which is really quite important, although maybe not so uh, widely known as, as the others. Uh, that's a way to make um, applications portable across data centers, essentially. So if you adhere to this standard, build uh, your application, on, let's say, Google, you can pick it up and move it to Amazon or from Amazon to IBM or from IBM to, um, to uh, Microsoft. So that's very, very important because it makes the cloud applications portable and avoids lock-in, uh, pro all the problems associated with lock-in. TensorFlow, that's in the machine learning side. It looks like there's two standards emerging, TensorFlow on the one hand and PyTorch on the other. PyTorch more for development and uh, Tensor more for uh, deployment. It's a very important uh, open source initiative. Then there's something called Flutter, which most people don't know about, but Flutter is a way to do user interfaces for applications. You can write one set of code and it will run on Android, iOS, Linux, Mac, Windows, Fuchsia, and uh, also on, on, on the web. So that's a case where you've got extreme portability if you develop using this uh, open source Fuchsia uh, model. And I think a lot of it comes down, a lot of the issues surrounding open source comes down to this point that it's very hard for companies or even individuals for that matter to commit themselves to future behavior. And it's, you can't say I'm going to maintain this product forever so what do you do? What you do is you make it an open source model and uh, people will adopt it because even if something goes wrong down the road, like the problem that Huawei faced, even if something goes wrong down the road, 
uh, then the, the OEM, the developers, have access to the operating system and can still utilize that existing source code. So it's a way of doing, uh, it's a way of doing commitment uh, to a model uh, in a way that's, I think, very compelling to potential uh, adopters. So I think I will stop there and uh, turn, turn it back to you, Richard. Thank you, Hal. Uh, Maureen or Darren, would you like to react to anything somebody else has said? Hal's already reacted. Uh, if, if not, I'll pose a question or two. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to then ask about another buzzword. We've, as you've all said, open closed is not simple and it's not yes, no. Um, and uh, it comes in various dimensions. Uh, another buzzword, which certainly uh, is on many pens these days, is interoperability. Uh, and interoperability, I think, comes in flavors too, and means seems to mean different things in different contexts. But it, it is sometimes treated, or sometimes uh, alleged, not quite that sharply, but that requiring interoperability uh, is a is a magic pill to erode platform dominance. It may also raise privacy issues, privacy concerns. And as a former person concerned with privacy, I'm gonna ask Maureen to react to interoperability and then we'll go down the line. But is it, is it a magic pill? Uh, is, it, is it a threat to privacy? Does it mean very different things in different contexts? Well, so, so much like open and close, I think, you know, interoperability, um, you know, can be a, you know, very good thing. It can help expand, you know, like you're, you're trying to sell, <laughs> you know, you're, you're trying to sell phones and it's great if there's a lot of apps, right? Because <laughs> it drives demand for, for, for phones and, you know, but uh, you may not want uh, to be forced into interoperability if it's not part of you know your your business model but it often comes up um you know the house judiciary report talked about it but it, it also comes up with the idea of reducing lock-in reducing you know uh the ability of an entity to like once you've kind of committed to them that you have to you know stay with stay with them forever that you should that other systems should be able to you know kind of feed into that and and uh, then then compete. But the thing I w one thing I really wanted to talk about was portability, was data portability, which is also often yeah. referred to as a way to reduce lock-in, to overcome uh, you know dominance uh, by allowing, and there's kind of two flavors of it. Um, and as a former privacy enforcer, um, you know, I'm, I'm sensitive, <laughs> more sensitive to one of the flavors than, than to the others. So, so there are these ideas that, well, because a data is so important, and there were, I have some questions about sort of the all magic power of data, uh, <laughs> but particularly about consumers, um, is the idea that, well, the way to kind of reduce the, this lock-in is to have, um, portability of the consumer's data, that they are, you know, they have invested a lot in the platform, they've got a lot of information on the platform, uh, and so they're going to get, it's going to be sticky, they're going to stay with that platform, but if they can easily extract that data that they've provided and then plug it in, so that's kind of the interoperability for it, part, to, to another uh, service platform would have you product, that that will mitigate the, these effects. So, so as a pri so as, as a privacy, um, you know, wearing my privacy hat as, in addition to my antitrust hat, I ha where I get concerned is where there this idea is not so much that it is the decision of each individual consumer to take that data and to port it somewhere else. That what the response is going to be is to make companies have to share that data, have to share their data about, about consumers. So I, uh, I have concerns about that on a, on a privacy level because generally what privacy law is supposed to do is to help consumers control where their data 
who has access to the data and how it's being used, not to open it up and just say, well, it's out of your hands, consumers are going to give it to someone else um, for competition reasons. But it, this is really an, an issue that's coming to the fore. I wrote an article last year for, C, for CPI called um, a Competition uh, and Privacy, Friends, Foes, or Frenemies, because, you know, sometimes like competition on privacy can be a, be a good thing. Um, sometimes locking down data can impact competition. We saw that when Europe uh, enacted the GDPR and it restricted the flow and access of data and created a lot of regulatory complexity. And it ended up having competitive effects because smaller um, companies couldn't couldn't uh, you know have access to data or and, and they didn't get investment and they left the market. So it actually helped entrench big <laughs> players. Um, but, but then the idea is that um, should companies have to share their data? And there was an interesting case in the Ninth uh, Circuit where um, LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn has its, um, you know, profiles of users and LinkedIn has made certain promises to those users about how their data would be accessed. And there was another company called HiQ that was scraping the data from the LinkedIn site and then using it to create products, one of which was to notify uh, employers because there's people tend to do certain things when they're starting to go on the job market. And one of them is to update their LinkedIn profile <laughs> in certain ways. So HiQ was creating this kind of report from this and then selling it to employers and saying, this person's a flight risk for you. So LinkedIn tried to enforce its terms against HiQ and say, you can't scrape that data that way. Um, it violates you know, our promises to our users. Um, and uh, the, the lower court and the Ninth Circuit upheld that they weren't able to get an injunction to stop that because of the antitrust concerns. And they, they didn't at all look at the privacy implications about individual consumers who shared their data with LinkedIn based on certain promises. So this idea of a loss of consumer sovereignty over their data based on antitrust concerns is very antithetical to privacy law, where we're seeing in privacy law much more uh, push towards giving consumers more control over their data. Yeah, one of the th the other issues that really comes in there is, uh, so there's federal privacy legislation being considered, and I've, you know, have, I've testified on that. And you know, one of the provisions it has is to allow consumers, if they want to, to be able to have access to the data that they gave to a company, and then to be able to port it over to another player. And so that kind of keeps the sovereignty more in the consumer in the consumer's hands. But kind of going back to this other issue of, you know, investment and what will companies do is there is this question. So there's the data that a consumer gave to whatever company, user platform, uh, a company, product platform, what have you. But oftentimes the value for the for the the holder of the data is not so much. It's Maureen Olhausen and she lives here and she does that, but it's what they infer about you, right? What they infer what your typically purchase behaviors are going to be. And so then there's this question about whether when consumers pull that data out, is it just the data they put in or is, does the inferred data, what was inferred about the consumers have to go to? And I think that is a little bit of an underappreciated issue right now, because I think that raises the same kinds of issues as, a, you know, an essential facilities doctrine. Right, to say, well, you know, for companies, they're creating value out of this data using, you know, their, you know, own analytics. And do they have to share those analytics with, with a competitor? Um, so it's a pretty com complicated area um, where antitrust and privacy are sort of, you know, coming together at awkward angles. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so stay tuned. <laughs> Uh, but I, uh, I do have some, you know, there are some fine points that really need to be worked out. And I think, again, the Haiku LinkedIn case was a very, very interesting uh, case that, that dis discussed that issue. And it was in the Ninth Circuit, which, you know, California is supposed to be really um, sensitive about privacy. And the court didn't talk about privacy, consumer privacy. Like, they just didn't include that 
really as a concern. So they, or they didn't give it credit over the antitrust concerns. Thanks, Maureen. Darren, uh, did, did the uh, House Judiciary uh, Committee report, uh, which did talk about interoperability, did they get it right? Did they discuss privacy? They did discuss this issue. Uh, not sure they quite got it right. Um, so, you know, as your question suggests, that you know the House Judiciary Committee did look at this issue, did look at data portability, looked at interoperability, and you know recommended both of these approaches to try to address some of the concerns that, that they found uh, in uh, digital markets. Um, just a little bit of background on the report in terms of sort of what led them to that conclusion. Uh, you know, they, they looked at digital markets, uh, in particular social uh, networks, was kind of the main area of their focus in this respect. And, you know, found that, you know, certain digital markets have characteristics like network effects, switching costs, you know, high entry barriers, that make them prone to tipping in favor of a single firm, uh, which makes things difficult uh, for new entrants. Um, and again, they focused on social networks, but also pointed to mobile platforms and e-commerce um, as two other areas where this was a particular concern. So the report recommended that Congress consider mandating data interoperability and portability, which they viewed as potentially lowering entry barriers um, for competitors and also lowering switching costs for consumers. Um, and they cited to a, a consumer survey where can, most consumers said that they wanted it to be easier for the ability to switch uh, to a new platform without losing their important data or connections. And I thought what was sort of interesting was that the report took the position that doing this, mandating interoperability and implementing it, would actually be uh, low cost. The term they used was relatively low cost uh, to do this but offer no data in support of that very provocative <clears throat> claim. So, you know, in terms of, you know, what do we take out of this report? Um, I'm probably gonna echo some of the, the comments that Maureen just mentioned. But again, I think maybe to go back to a, Dick's initial comments at the beginning of this program, you know, definitions matter. And so it maybe it's helpful to start with, you know, what do we even mean by our operability? I mean, it's actually a, it's a term that's been around for a long time. And from a sort of computer science perspective, you know, it's, I think there's a relatively well accepted understanding, which, you know, refers to two components or systems that work together without errors. So that you can send data from one to the other without loss. When we're talking about interoperability in the current context, it's a little bit broader than that. And I think it's evolving. I mean, I'm not sure that this is actually even static for what the proponents were, are calling for here. But, you know, as Maureen described, you know, advocates, such as the Judiciary uh, Committee reporter calling for digital platforms to open up their platforms to uh, allow facilitator even mandate you know, greater competition against the platform sponsor. And typically we see calls for a new federal regulator that would dictate the terms of this interoperability. And you know, what is, what's the relationship between interoperability and data portability? I think in general, interoperability should be thought of as a more sort of advanced or powerful form of data portability. Uh, and that, that's because data portability requires typically affirmative steps by the users. You, know, you tell one service, you know, please export my data to this other service. And it's a one-time operation. And then you want to do it again a month later to a different service, you have to go through the steps again. And so critics see that type of data portability as potentially insufficient to really get at the lower switching costs, the lower entry barriers that they're trying to achieve. And so what interoperability in this context is trying to achieve is by forcing kind of a permanent interconnection between different services, which would usually be through like an open API or some kind of you know, interconnection like that. So to give an example of this, so if I'm on Facebook, but I decide to leave, but to go to some other social network, but my friends all stay on Facebook, what interoperability would mean is that the two services could connect so that my friends post on Facebook, I would still be able to see on my new service and my likes and other posts, they would be able to see on their service without my having to say, you know, please export my data. It would just happen automatically in largely real time. And there's sort of two components of data portability. Uh, there's at least some have described it this way, a horizontal and a vertical approach. So horizontal is sharing 
data or, or inter interoperability with a horizontal competitor. So that's, that was sort of my example. It's, it's Facebook sharing with another social network. And when you think about this, you know, what's, what's the antitrust theory for this to the extent there is one, it's, it's really a refusal to deal. And so I mean, to the extent that there's any case law to support this, you, know, you might look at Aspen skiing. So where you might need a you know, pre-existing course of dealing before you could have potential liability here. And then you have vertical interoperability. And so that's, um, again, providing a connection, APIs or some other way with uh, services in adjacent markets. So this would be you know, Facebook providing its data to say Pandora, a music service. Uh, and so this is probably where the essential facilities doctrine would be relevant to the extent that, again, you can articulate an antitrust theory uh, to require this sort of thing. Obviously, neither of these theories have a lot of support under U.S. case law at this point, but I think that's sort of where you would look for case law support, if any, uh, for either of those horizontal or vertical approach. So, I mean, getting back to the Judiciary Committee report, I think the report doesn't do a good job of highlighting the benefits of interoperability and data portability, at least at a high level, but it fails to acknowledge a lot of the complexities here uh, that Marina already touched on and doesn't engage in any kind of cost-benefit analysis. It only points really to the benefits and just kind of brushes aside the costs. So you don't see a recognition of the significant privacy and security issues with interoperability. You don't see anything in terms of you know, do these things uh, affect companies to incentives to invest you know, in data-driven products and services. And you don't see even really any recognition, much less attempt to take on the really, really difficult practical issues here. You know, who has an obligation to interoperate? With whom must a company interoperate? Again, for horizontal versus vertical interoperability. And then within that, does everybody in the industry get access uh, in, to your open APIs or can you limit it in certain respects? What data should be available to the other service? Uh, you know, should somebody be responsible for, for developing standards uh, to facilitate interoperability, or is it just going to be kind of the wild west of you know, every set of companies are going to develop their own standards in terms of how they're going to share uh, data? And who's responsible if something goes wrong? You know, if there's a um, an unfortunate, you know, privacy problem, uh, personal data is leaked, who's responsible in that situation? I think the other thing, too, we ought to keep in mind, I I wouldn't be surprised if Hal was going to touch on this, uh, but the you know the industry is already taking a lot of steps here, and there's there's frequently not a recognition of this. And I'll just to give you sort of three examples. Uh, so there's the data transfer project, and this is a group that consists of a lot of the big tech companies: Apple, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, and these are working on an open source data portability system. So it's designed to make it very easy for a consumer to say, I want to you know, uh, move my data over to this other service uh, in a very easy way. Um, so that is underway. There's, I think, tens of thousands of lines of code have already been developed, which I think is an illustration of actually how challenging this can be, uh, that there is that much work that's involved in, in doing this. But, but the industry is responding to consumers' concerns. Even before this, a lot of these companies already provide ways for consumers to export their data. Um, and then certain types of apps where it's relatively easy to do this data exporting, data portability or interoperability, it's already there. So for example, health and fitness apps are a great example of this. Most, if not all, you know, the most popular fitness apps allow for not only data portability, but open APIs that allow real-time sharing of data between fitness apps. So for example, if I'm using a Fitbit device, but I like to use Strava, which is a popular fitness app, you can go to each app and say, basically, I want the two of you to talk to each other and share data in real time. And this is a widespread feature of these types of apps. And the reason I think for that is that it's pretty simple to do. I mean, you're not looking, you're not dealing with a lot of different types of data. You're looking at, you know, number of steps, you know, distance travel, you know, it's a fairly defined set of, you know, data types. And so it's relatively easy for companies to share this kind of data. And in fact, there are a couple of standards that have developed in the industry uh, in terms of data types specifically for fitness apps to facilitate this sort of uh, exchange. So I think the industry is actually doing a really good job here in trying to respond to, you know, consumer demand for greater portability uh, of their data. But I think we just need to be cognizant of 
uh, the significant costs to do this in terms of facilitating this access, as well as uh, the obviously very real uh, privacy concerns. Thanks, Darren. I, I realize as moderator, I'm not supposed to say anything, but I do remember the telecommunications era when local companies were required to provide access. And there was a little bit of debate about the terms on which they would provide access, uh, reminding us that requirement to provide access does not actually solve problems. It makes good work for lawyers. Hal? Yeah, yeah, I was going to mention one important uh, issue that, that was touched on in uh, Maureen and Darren's uh, discussion is uh, what happens when there are multiple parties involved in the data that's exchanged. So I have photos of me and many other people. Presumably I own those photos, but do they have any rights in those photos at all? And if I move my photos from one service to another, uh, do they have any say in that? I think the logical answer has got to be no. This is like look at 150 years ago when photography was first developed, there was this whole issue of whether you had to get permission to photograph a crowd. And uh, the answer had to be no, just because of the transaction costs that are available. But the same thing goes for email. Email is a thread now, and that thread could involve many different people. Do each of the people in that thread have a right to that uh, data? So that, that, that's going to be uh, come up sometime in the next uh, few years. And as, uh, as Darren said, uh, we have this Google Takeout, which allows you to download all of the data sets that Google has about you. I think there's about 50 of them now. And uh, you can do what you want with them. There's also this data transfer project where, where companies have agreed on a common standard for, say, photos. And so you can actually seamlessly exchange them from one to another. So, so that is being uh, tackled. There's a very interesting standards body uh, this, that's uh, working now to, to standardize data schema. That is the way data is organized. So I direct you all to schema.org where you can see a number of attempts to standardize how recipes are described or how photos are described or how products are described. And these have actually been very, very uh, successful in terms of making more seamless transfer of data among different uh, devices, different operating systems, different databases, et cetera, because they've got that standardization pipe in the middle that allows them to uh, do that. So industry is working very strongly on these uh, this set of issues. Thank you, Hal. I think we've just about run out of time. We could clearly explore these uh, complex issues at some length, but perhaps our audience wouldn't stay with us for the next five hours. So I think I will, uh, on everyone's behalf, thank our distinguished panel and draw this session to a close. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Bye.